good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. My name is LaCorey Meadows. Good afternoon, my name is LaCorey Meadows. I'm a member of the Columbus Metropolitan Club Board of Trustees. I also serve as a director of Franklin County Extension. It is such a pleasure to see everyone here today. Okay, so for today's forum, uh, we're very excited to have a wonderful speaker here. Um, our title is Wild Ride Ahead for Our Food System. Dr. David Hughes, this forum was developed with a partnership with the Ohio Agricultural Council and sponsored by the Ohio Agribusiness Association as well as the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. Each are represented here today by many colleagues and friends. Won't you please help me thank them for their sponsorship. With more emphasis on lo local foods and with our co-presenter being the Ohio Agricultural Council, our chef made an extra effort to source local providers for today's lunch. Our meals today featured ingredients from several local providers that included Gerber Farms, Dairy, Dairymen's, and Middlefield Farms. Let's say thank you to our wonderful chef. Food is essential for life. In human history, from hunter-gatherers to the first efforts of cultivation, constant technological advances allow us to produce larger quantities and higher quality of food for lower costs. But the pace of change of populations, of environments, of species, and of taste leaves us with many questions. To help answer those questions and to shed light on our complex food systems, we are pleased to welcome all the way from London, England. I loved his accent when he was talking earlier. <laughs> um, internationally renowned food professor, Dr. David Hughes. Following his remarks, Dr. Hughes would join the director of Ohio State's Food Innovation Center, Dr. Ken Lee, for conversation. Dr. Hughes, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Wow, well, I'm uh, delighted and honored to talk to such a, an august group. Uh, I do have some American bona fides. I, I lived and worked in the U.S. for uh, a, a number of years. I started a business, in, a food business in Florida. Um, we grew it and then sold it, and that gave me enough money that I could afford to be a professor, you know, one way or another. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, I've got to get cracking because uh, there's somebody tell you, you've got to be on the minute or you get booted off. <laughs> so here we go, sort of world food. Uh, world population, right, it's give or take, it's 7.2 billion people in 2016, last year. Is, is that a lot? Do you think that's a lot? 7,200 million people? I mean, it, it strikes me it's a lot because if I went back 44 years, in August 1973, my wife and I emigrated from the UK to Canada, and the population of the world in August 1973 was 3.6 billion. So in my professional lifetime, the population of the world has doubled. I might say we contributed an additional two, and we're, <laughs> we're rather pleased with that. But I, I, can, I can remember back in, in 73, the view was we're going to double the population over the next 40 years. That was the forecast, and it's turned out to be so. There was a prevailing view. It would be a Malthusian end, that uh, there would be damage done, uh, mal mal malnutrition would increase, uh, that we wouldn't cope. And the fact of the matter is that we have. Uh, that they're proportionally a much less poorer people and malnourished people now than they were back in the, in the 1970s. So, okay, now let's sort of jump forward. It's only about another 25 years because we're going to add another 2 billion people. And again, I hear ringing in my ears people saying, we can't cope, there's going to be malnourishment, etc. And I think, hmm, I've heard that, that before. It sounds uh, familiar. So where are the two million coming from? Actually, the, the, the continent where you'll see the most explosive population growth will be Africa, where the population, it has a population roughly of a billion, and it will go to two billion. And what intrigues me about that is that a, sorry, is that a brilliant food marketing opportunity for the number one food exporter in the world, which is the US. Uh, so is, is it great, or is it a social problem? Now, I, I've lived and worked in Africa for four or five years, and I'm very Africa positive. Uh, and if I look at the top ten fastest growing countries economically in the world, eight are in Africa. But it still strikes me that doubling that population will bring 
marketing opportunities, but also it will bring social problems, I would suggest. And what people get really interested in, though, is the growth in Asia from four plus billion at the moment to five plus billion in 25 years' time. And why the interest there? Because you can see incomes escalating and you can see diets changing in front of your eyes. And they're starting to trade up, if you will, in the world of food. And that brings superb opportunities, not least for the US and no doubt for Ohio. So of that extra two billion, that we're going to add, are they, is it just sort of a rough representation of the, the rest of the world? Not at all. I mean, this isn't a political comment, but of the two billion, uh, one billion will be Muslim. Is that a sort of Trump-esque statement? Uh, no, no, it's, 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 it's a fact. Uh, but so what? Is it just cocktail conversation, or how might that affect the food industry? What do you think? Adding an extra billion Muslims. Yes? down the front is probably not terrific for the pork industry, is it? No, 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 no not super duper, yes, that's it. And, and then if you take the other billion, the better part of 700 million will be uh, from the Indian subcontinent and uh, largely Hindu. So who, who might that benefit on, or disbenefit? I mean, probably the beef guys aren't saying, yeah, that's the way to go, let's, let's head for, for India, no, but, uh, but actually if you look at, if I look around the world at meat consumption growth, the two countries where it's growing the fastest, perhaps surprisingly, is India and Pakistan. Uh, both of them are extraordinarily low meat eaters at the moment, in fact there's a prevailing view that Indians are all vegetarian, not so, uh, and you can see now meat consumption just starting to take off. What were they most likely to eat? I would think probably chicken and the most frequently consumed meat in the world, which is come on, come on, come on, fish, it's fish, it's fish, thank you very much, fish, fish is meat, fish is meat. It's one of the most intriguing things that I, I do a lot of work in the meat industry and that meat industry people refuse to acknowledge fish as being a, a competitor. But mind you, it's the other way around too that fish people just dismiss you know, meat as saying, no, it's all, it's all a lot of nonsense. So, so we've got an extra two billion people uh, arriving and actually, if we wanted to slow that down, what's the best way? to slow down the rate of population growth. Educate women. What about uh, sexual abstinence? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. The, the pill, yeah. But actually, probably the best way is what we're already doing, which is urbanization. You put people in cities, and like phew, within half a generation, you can see population growth just plummet. I mean, the best example for me would be in, say, South Africa, where in rural South Africa, the average household might have seven children. Put them into Joburg, and it drops to two or less, just like that, just very quickly. Why? Because, of course, in rural areas, in poor rural areas, extra children are, is cheap labor, and also it's like an insurance for the, for the parents in their older age. Put them into the city, and it's a cost. And you see that right around, around the world. It's in, intriguing. Even in Bangladesh, which has a high rate of uh, population growth, put them into Dhaka, Bangladesh, and very quickly, whew, then the household size goes right, right down. Excuse me, I've got, to, I've got to keep on at my notes here. Normally, I've got a screen, and I can take sneaky looks at it. Uh, so, but on population, what do I say here? Keep your eyes on China and India. Uh, why? Because the combined population there is 2.8 billion. 2.8 billion. And so whatever those two countries elect to eat more of or less of has a completely disproportional effect on world markets. So and it doesn't matter if it's cabbage or, uh, or chicken. If, uh, let's take ch China, if China elects to have one kilo per capita more of a certain meat, then somebody has to find, we all have to find an extra 1.3 million tons of that meat. So China and India together have the great ability to make markets, to make superb markets in terms of growth for agriculture and food products.
But then what you have to watch is if they decide, if they go off something, they can break markets. Now, we saw that big time, I would suggest, over the last two or three years with dairy, uh, where around the world we thought dairy was looking really good. And uh, in the US, in Europe, in New Zealand and Australia, we expanded milk supply to take advantage of burgeoning markets in China. And then the Chinese had a little bit of an economic hiccup, backed off from dairy, and markets collapsed. And we saw, for example, prices like $5,000 US per ton for milk powder fall to $1,300 per ton uh, in a five-month period. Can you imagine doing business planning in that sort of environment? That's really, really difficult. Right. Uh, so uh, just to finish off on, uh, on meat, what do I think is happening in the world, world of meat? Actually, it's, it's sort of in intriguing that, uh, oh, no, not yet. Uh, so <laughs> I've got another point. Uh, which is, what, if I look over the next two, three, four, five years in the, the global market for meat, you know, Ohio has some meat aspirations, then actually what we're seeing is a global fist fight, bare-knuckled, ear-pulling, eye-gouging fight between industrially produced chicken and industrially produced fish. Now, why would that be so? Why would that be so? I mean, first of all, almost all the growth in meat consumption demand is in emerging countries, so what we used to call developing countries, and their preference is often for the so-called white meats. But secondly, and more importantly, I think, it's just the cheapest protein around. For, there's some chicken guys in the... Uh, what, what's the best chicken conversion feed into chicken meat? 1.2 to 1. 1.2 to 1? And what would be the best for, say, tilapia or pangasius? You might call it catfish. You might call it bassa in, in Vietnam. Probably one-to-one. One. Probably one-to-one. One-to-one. So you can feed pangasius, catfish, almost anything. And they'll convert it's one kilo of it, and they'll, con and they'll convert that into one kilo of fish. Uh, so in emerging countries where incomes are just starting to go from very low to, to slightly higher, then the first rush is more meat, but a meat that they can afford. Where are we? OK, so let's look at grains and oil seeds and uh, uh, the Midwest. Uh, I know you're just on the, on the side of it. Uh, so what do you think is the biggest driver of price variation and price movements in grains and oil seeds? What would be the, the factor that most drives it? Fuel. So fuel? In, uh, fuel costs. Okay, you're, you're getting close, but no cigar at the moment. <laughs> Weather. Weather. You know, so we, you might say climate events, for example. You know, one of which we had. If you went back, was it three or four years ago in the Midwest, where there was that drought that was the harshest you've had in in in, in history, and that collapses uh, yield and production in the Midwest. And, and it's one of the peculiar things about farmers uh, around around the all the way around the world. Farmers around the world like a bloody good disaster <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we don't want to, you know, harm to Midwest farmers, but, we, but I keep looking at that map and I want to see a big red blob in the middle which says you've got no water because I know my Welsh and English farmers go, yes, yeah, nice. nice. So, yes, that drives uh, prices, but actually the, the single most influential factor driving the price of grains and oil seeds is the price of oil. And for the last 10 years or more, because of actions actually initially taken by governments, there's now a direct link between oil prices and cereal and oil seed prices because of biofuel policies. It's astonishing, actually. If you plot the movement in Brent crude, so in, a, you know, a, a, in, in essentially world oil prices, you can just put onto it the prices of all other grains and oilseeds, and they just follow it. So I would suggest for those, I mean, it's, this isn't necessarily great for you, because uh, I know grain prices are relatively low at the moment, if you will. But uh, I don't think we're going to see a much hiccup up in oil prices over the next uh, year or two. And if that's the case, you're not going to see, unless there's a crop disaster somewhere, you're not going to see grain prices uh, going up either, which is sort of tough for you guys. I know that. Another element, of course, is uh, let's get away from grains that drives prices would be just disease. And we've seen that in uh, China 
with AI, as they call it, not artificial insemination, but avian influenza, uh, where demand for chicken has collapsed in, in, in China, where they just keep well away from it. And then also in an area which I think is particularly pertinent to, to you guys at, at the moment too, there are political events which sometimes are very, very difficult to pre, uh, prejudge. Uh, so I'll give you one example, then we'll come straight to you. So about six years ago, the Norwegians, they only give one Nobel Prize, and that's the, the Peace Prize, and they gave it to a Chinese dissonant. The Chinese government didn't like that, so they banned imports of Norwegian salmon. And still to this day, that can't get into China. Uh, the more recent happenings in Mexico are, again, a sort of an example of how political machinations can affect, you know, as I understand it, is it the Mexicans say that they, uh, they might say no to your corn because of uh, things to do with walls and stuff which is well above my head. <laughs> so there we go. Hang on. I thought it was going to uh, move on, David. Okay. And, and again, back on to, uh, 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 to global food trends, there's a sort of interesting circularity of trends. So if we take, in the U.S., Demand consumption of wheat flour, wheat flour over the last uh, from 1997 to 2015 has declined by 10 percent. Why so? Well, a lot of it that's linked to increasing concern about gluten. You know, odd in itself because we know that three percent of the world is celiac, uh, uh, that awful disease. But there's something like 25 percent of Americans are consciously trying to reduce their gluten intake, and that's reduce. Uh, flour consumption by 10%. However, go to other parts of the world, like Asia, then wheat flour consumption is going up. So, you know, one sort of counteracts the other. You see it with, uh, what else have I got, uh, got here? Rice. Uh, suddenly, Africa is, uh, has a, a great preference for rice, even though they don't necessarily have the conditions to grow it, and they're dropping their more traditional uh, cereals, which in themselves, if you think, you have poor people tend to want carbohydrates eaten by rich people. And then, funnily enough, rich people more recently seem to want carbohydrates eaten by poor people. <laughs> so, you know, look at this uh, sudden interest in quinoa, in chia, in millet, in sorghum. I mean, for goodness sake, uh, quinoa in particular, you can't hold your head up in polite society unless you have a, just a jot of it for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the most peculiar. And, and, and meat is the same. As you see, overall global meat consumption is, meat demand is growing, but actually it is at best static or indeed declining in uh, Western economies, but that's compensated by an increase in uh, emerging countries, just as well for the, for the meat industry. So that gives it some uh, balance. And, and what about insects? What about insect protein? Would we eat insects in Ohio? They will in Manhattan, it's very fashionable. <laughs> so you're seeing cricket flour made into little chips for dipping, etc. Et but, uh, but actually, clearly, we are going to eat insects going forward, but actually it's much more likely to be in the form of livestock feed and fish feed. Uh, you know, you look at the fecundity, if that's right, the fertility of many insects in terms of reproductive rate, etc. I mean, the nice thing about crickets is you don't have to wait nine months for them to reproduce. I mean, over a long weekend, they can sort of <laughs> put, a, sort of put a good fist at it. So, uh, so there we go. And then also what we're saying in terms of protein, while I'm on protein, is that people's perception, understanding, and desire for protein, particularly in the US, but also in other developed countries, is broadening. And there's been a huge increase in interest in plant-based proteins, not least in the US. They're extraordinarily fashionable. I think it's way more than just a trend, They're just a fad, so it's much, much more than that. Uh, so for example, if I look at, uh, are you pulse growers in Ohio? Chickpeas, peas, lentils, anything like that? A little bit. I mean, there's, if you look nationally, then it's been a, a significant increase over the last 10 years in pulses and you know, vegetable-based protein, uh, if, if you will. And what's more, that isn't being exported, it's being used internally. So what I tell guys in the meat industry is that their competitive range is now increasing. That increasingly people are saying, I think I'll eat less meat, 
Uh, I want to eat more protein, however, and that protein could be dairy-based, for example, whey protein, or it could be plant protein-based. I think the good news, though, from a, a meat point of view is that people say, I will eat less meat, but when I do, I want to eat better meat, and what's more, I'll pay more for less. Perhaps I can come back to that in a minute. Um, okay, uh, so consumer stuff, I uh, recognize, remind me, five minutes, ten minutes? Yeah, just keep going, you know, yakking away. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what I think is encouraging, if I look particularly right around the world too, is that we've now gone past the depth of despondency when people had no particular interest in where food comes from, and increasingly they do. Increasingly, not just in the US, but right around the world, people say, excuse me, where, where does this food come from? Our preference is to know where it comes from. Actually, we prefer it to be local if, if, if we can. And, uh, and that even goes to the ingredients. You know, you think back 10, 15 years ago, you'd buy some processed food product, you wouldn't read what the ingredients are. And now, right across the world, people want to see fewer ingredients, ones, as they say, you can put in your mouth, uh, that, uh, that ones they can pronounce. Uh, they want to see few, they want to see it natural, and they want to know who produced it and how they produced it. I think that's really good news for farmers overall because, uh, I mean, as I interpret it, what that means to me is that consumers globally are coming closer to farmers, actually whether farmers like it or not, and, uh, no, which, and, uh, which, is, which is great, great news. Here we go. So, yes, so I need to talk more about consumers, consumer trends, um, what's happening here. Let me give you a UK example, but it also I could relate it to uh, the US too. In 2016, of all the meals eaten in the UK in 2016, 40%, four out of 10 meals, were eaten by one person alone. It's a little sad, isn't it? It's, it's solo dining. And another 40% of all meals eaten were eaten by two people together. So that sort of notion of family around the table, you know, two parents, da da da, long gone. And actually, even if that does happen, if you have four people around the table, they don't necessarily eat the same thing. And why not? You know, because Brenda's bloody gluten-free. You, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, where did that come from? It's, uh, you know, dear Lord. Yeah. And she's got ballet. She's got to hurry up. It's, uh, you know. And, and so, yeah, what's the imp so, so what? Is that just cocktail conversation that 40% of meals are solo... Uh, eat, eat. No, it has a huge implication for the food industry. So, I mean, what do you think? What would that bring? How does that change eating behavior? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to pop home and make, you know, a sensible beef stew for one, are you? Or else you'll have to eat it all week, apart from anything else. You're much more likely to eat out or to buy, some, buy the meal and take it home or as we're all doing anyway. I mean, I mean again, I, I'll use an old-fashioned term, and I'm sorry, you know, I'm British and all, so it's, you know, it's all English grammar, etc. cetera. We, we used, to, uh, used to go to supermarkets to buy things, excuse me about the word, we used to go to buy things called ingredients. <laughs> and of course, now we don't buy ingredients, do we? We buy meal components, and they go <laughs> and then I cooked. Yeah, and I want the kudos for, for doing that. So, and, and, and that's, on the one hand, people want health and well-being, and that's a, a, a global trend. You, you just see I, everywhere I go, it's very, very powerful. But what, to use an expression, what trumps health and well-being is convenience. If a product isn't convenient to buy, to prepare, to consume, and then to dispose of, people won't buy it. It doesn't matter if it's the healthiest product in the world. And I, I, actually, we're starting to see some, some interesting uh, developments in, say, traditional vegetables. So if, if I ask anybody in the room, admit to spiralizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the odd one, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, there's no shame. No, no shame. There is counseling, but there's no shame. <laughs> but, but, you know, spiralizing. So turning traditional vegetables like squash, like carrots like um, zucchini into pasta lookalikes uh, has had extraordinary hold in, in many countries. I think that's, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's brought new life to traditional uh, vegetables. Also, it's pretty healthy. And it's a great way to sneak into 
uh, children, uh, vegetables that uh, they wouldn't normally eat. It's the, this, this advance of stealth vegetables has to be good. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I, if I think back, at, uh, I, we had two boys, and my, my youngest boy, when he was about six, for, for two years, he decided he wouldn't eat anything green. You know, you know, you know how they are. I mean, it's, uh, it's not, just not easy. OK, uh, and, and then moving on, I've got about uh, two minutes, and then I have to stop, as I understand it. But again, how the whole notion of the meal has changed. So in history, and particularly in the US, I mean, God love you, it's, how do you put a meal together in the US? You start with a plate, and preferably a big one. <laughs> and then, <laughs> in the middle, you put a big piece of meat. And then you do, 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 dot around it the sort of stuff your mother would be proud of, you know, which is little bits of vegetable. And that's mine. And I'm going to eat all of it. You know, that's it. Not yours, it's mine. That's very an Asian. Remember, think about Asia, where there are six or eight dishes where everybody shares, dips in, etc., and you never quite finish anything. It's, it's a completely different culture. But if I think back to the 1990s in the US, the US Cattlemen's Association had a very successful strap line, which was beef. It's what's for dinner. You remember that? Beef. Now, would that work in 2017? Beef. I mean, if, you, if the children say, what's for dinner, you don't come back proud and say, beef. <laughs> No, you, you, you might say uh, Chinese. <laughs> yeah. you, uh, you, you might say Mexican, or you know, uh, no, it's a takeaway, or Italian. That's what you what you say. And in fact, millennials, remember that pesky group between 20 and 32 <laughs> year olds, are much more likely to say dinner. What's dinner? <laughs> I mean, th that doesn't fit in their notion of eating. Much more likely to have a series of mini meals and snacks. Uh, and that we have to ad adapt. And nutritionists don't like that, but there's no reason why that can't be healthy too. You can have healthy snacks and healthy <laughs> mini meals. So it's, you know, the, the world is changing, and we have to change our products to go along with it. And that's the melanin's right, last little run in here. Uh, so I just thought I'd try you on something which is slightly exotic. It's that, uh, again, I'm back to, I could do meat and uh, gr grains here. I have a strong view, thinking from a food industry, a farming point of view here, that uh, if you're in the meat business, you're in beef or you know, pork, chicken. It's always, they're the nouns. Okay. And I, I do a lot of work in the beef industry where, uh, I don't know, it's always, it's dominated by men, large men with big hands and no, and no necks. <laughs> and, and, and they're often red of face and they increasingly look like the animals they slaughter. <laughs> And when I ask them, you know, what business is it, they go, beef. <laughs> and I said, look, I don't believe there's much margin in beef. That's the noun. I think the, the adjectives are, the, that's where the margin is. So what do I mean by that? Well, what, you know, like Angus beef, uh, Neiman Ranch beef, uh, grass-fed beef, dry-aged beef, uh, you know, specific provenance beef, uh, get branded beef the margins in the adjectives. But I think increasingly you'll find the same is going to be in for grains and oilseeds through time. Uh, because what do I see? That uh, as the research and development tends to shift from public to private, we're now starting to see grains and oilseeds with very specific consumer benefits, often health-related benefits. And I would suggest in 20 years' time that rather than being a cereals producer, a wheat farmer, or, or, or a canola farmer, or whatever it is, that you're go that's going to be the wheat farmer, that's the noun. That the money, again, is going to be in the adjectives. So it's going to be high-fiber barley. It's going to be low or no gluten wheat. It's going to be omega-3 canola. It's going to be uh, non-GMO something or other. Or uh, not just lentils, but puy lentils, or you know, an old variety, of, uh, or a heritage variety, if, if you will. So I think, you know, the world is changing. And, um, uh, and let's try and finish here on a bang. Oh, dear Lord, not easy. <laughs> and as I say, the consumers, they're a pesky lot. They are. And they want everything. You know, they're pushing that we become greener. 
Uh, and so greener in terms, in, in its wider sense, better for the environment, better for animal welfare, better for workers, etc. Et There's a lot of pressure here. And increasingly, I believe, they won't pay for that. They just expect it. So I think the game is, is just coming more and more difficult. And what's more, you don't get a premium for getting over the green bar, but you get a discount if you go under. And what's more, they want their food free. And what do I mean by free? Well, they want it hormone free. They want it Campylobacter free. Uh, they want it E. coli free. Uh, they want it gluten free, etc. But you know, I know we tend to uh, sometimes think, oh, dear Lord, where do they get off? You know, do, what can we do to influence them? Well, of course, we have to work hard on that. But let's remember that actually, in the food industry, there's only one group that puts their hands in their pocket and comes out with some money, and they drive the industry, and they happen to be consumers. I'd be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. I had the best job, actually the second best job. You did the best job ever, and it's actually a difficult job to follow such a wonderful presentation. Actually, uh, Professor Hughes, it's also known as Dr. Food, so if you try to get on the internet and find him, uh, Hughes is a common name, but Dr. Food is pretty exclusive. And I was astounded to find that you spend 290 days out of every year traveling the world, so your world perspective is just really very much appreciated. And I was just wondering, um, with that perspective, is the United States uh, following world food trends, or are world friend food trends changing the U.S. diet? Because here in Columbus, for example, this used to be a meat and potatoes town, but mm -hmm. with the, the great ethnic diversity we now have in, in this city, which mm -hmm. is test market city, we're typical American, yeah. we've become much more diverse in our food preferences. Yeah. You, I think you've answered your, your question. Yeah. I, I often get asked, you know, is the, is the world becoming westernized in its eating behavior, eating habits? And my response is, I think we're more likely that we're being Asianized. Uh, you know, in terms of look at us, uh, uh, how people start to cook at home, it tends to be stir fried. We have our own uh, twist on a a Asian food. So, for example, um, let's say stir fried, so thin strips of meat are, are one thing in your country and bear no relationship to thin strips of meat, say, in, in, in Asia. I mean, your thin strips are essentially just uh, steaks. So, you, you know, eating patterns, they're entrenched. They take long periods, long time to, uh, to, to change. Uh, as I said, if we take, say, meat consumption, I'm not anti-meat by any manner of means, but uh, I mean, you guys eat, as I say, 110 kilos. Mm -hmm. If you put in fish, uh, you'd, no, sorry, 200 pounds plus. That, that's an astonishing amount. How on earth have you got the time to turn up here? I don't know. <laughs> You should be mining your way through a carcass at home. So, <laughs> and, but, but, you know, I see that as having certainly peaked, and that will go down. So, uh, yeah, more, it, it, there's, no Western, there's some westernization, but in general, we're Asianized. And I like your point about adjectives, because it's not just beef. But the uh, question, of course, is uh, the list of frees, which is interesting. You didn't mention GMO-free. Yes. Um, yeah. Where are we going with GMOs worldwide? Uh, worldwide. OK. In, in most countries, yeah. consumers are antagonistic, not enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. uh, well, why so? In fact, if we take sort of developed countries, or let's look at your near neighbor. The, the, the best research I've seen recently is in Canada, where consumers say, actually, we're sort of against GMOs uh, because nobody's ever told us what the advantages are. And I think that's a pretty good response. Um, we see there may be a downside. You haven't bothered to really sell the idea of what the upside is, and therefore uh, we feel we'll just push who's, it away. Who's but, you in that case? Is uh, the, industry? You, the industry. The industry. Uh, uh, however, if you want me to take the longer term, um, and I think if we continue to see, look, we're, we're already GMO'd. You know, like uh, any processed food will have soy and corn in it, and all well, that's GMO'd. Uh, we all wear, wear GMO uh, cotton. Uh, we, we feel comfortable having GMO fuel, corn and, uh, and, and, and canola. Uh, and I think over time, 
the resistance will decline and it's accelerated uh, when, for example, the, I was pleased to see that senior Greenpeace people left Greenpeace because of Greenpeace's view on uh, golden rice, which was the uh, GM rice which uh, added extra vitamins for children who currently are blinded because of the lack of that vitamin. And the senior people in uh, Greenpeace left because they felt Greenpeace were being immoral by being anti. Now, that sort of helps if you, if you want to advance the cause of, uh, of GM. But in Europe, it's going to take a while. You know, and your mention of children just leads me to this point, which is um, it's often known that if we put children on a strict vegan diet, for example, we might have failure to, to thrive mm -hmm. as one of the syndromes. Is, is meat an essential component for child nutrition, or are we trending more towards uh, less meat, more, more veggies? Uh, well, I, I say, in countries where meat consumption is really high, I don't think it's a bad thing for us to have a more uh, balanced diet. Do I think that the world is going vegetarian? No, and I'm just going to share something. It's not very scientific, right. and I'll only share it with you. It's, it's, it's very private, We're secret. We're yeah, yeah, secret. <laughs> we are being yeah. recorded. Yeah, but, but, the, uh, but the the research evidence from some universities shows that uh, that vegetarians have lower sperm counts. Uh, okay. Now, this is uh, it's only my view. I'm not anti-vegetarian. Especially uh, uh, vegetarian women. No, no, no. no that's, uh, <laughs> and and I, I'm not against vegetarians, but should we panic about the world going vegetarian? Now, my view is, keep it to yourself, but my view is that in another couple of generations, we'll have bred the bastards out. <laughs> not a word. Not, not, a, not a word. Yeah, keep, keep it quiet. <laughs> so it's, it's not very scientific. <laughs> Well, speaking of breeding, <laughs> um, I understand we're currently producing four babies per second per day of every day of the year. And I think we're disappearing at a rate of two people per person per second mm. per day of every year. Mm. Are either of those rates going to change? Because you kind of started off with the population paradigm. Um, are we just going to keep growing at that astronomical rate? I, I think what's going to happen is that the birth rate is, is dropping and dropping categorically, but of course we're living longer. I mean, the fact of the matter is that a child, and there's a, a lady who's, who's going to bear a boy on uh, next week. Uh, yes, thank you, well, well done, congratulations. <laughs> Good luck. And, and, and that child born next week uh, in the US, in most of uh, Europe, and indeed in China, would expect to have, the, the average lifespan will be 104 years. Now, so to just put that in a, some sort of social context, uh, and you, you can see the problem. So population will continue to grow, not least because it's just living longer, but bringing more and more cost, frankly. And that's going to be you know, quite the burden. If you, what I didn't mention, if you take China, uh, uh, the, the, the most aging uh, country is Japan. Mm -hmm. And it has a demographic or population profile, instead of being like a triangle, which is what, say, Pakistan, Indonesia, India would be, lots of little children and very few old people, then it's the, the, the opposite for, um, for Japan. Uh, there are 125 million people in Japan. Uh, they're losing a million uh, a, a year, by the way. China will have the same demographic profile by 2030 as Japan. So China is, they will get old before they get rich with all the consequential social problems associated with that in terms of health, et cetera. You know, remember, half the population has been smoking like chimneys. Mm -hmm. And with all the problems, that's going to be huge. Will that slow economic growth? You bet your life it will. So in 104 years, are we looking at quality of life as a major, that, major factor? Yeah, that, and that's the measure, isn't yeah. it? It's, uh, which is you know, what I'm trying to do. It's, it, you know, the fact of the matter is that when, when you turn 60, uh, for those who are just under that, uh, then you change y y your diet. And why might you do that? Del yeah, that's it, because, you know, here I am standing on a stage, if I don't trip up. I mean, when, when, when I turned 60 and I stood up on a stage, and, and if you look out, look right, look right, right out, you, you can see the end. <laughs> and, and you go, fuck it, there's the end. <laughs> I don't want the end. You know, how can I push it away? 
uh, and that's about well-being in older age, and it has a huge impact on the food industry. There's suddenly an, an unseemly rush to eat more fruit and vegetables and fish. When you know it's too late, <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you've done the damage over the last 40 years. Uh, and, but you can't stop yourself doing it, You're, or you tell sort of slight fibs to yourself. It's a bit like me with my drinking. It's but a, you're... <laughs> And what, what I do is I don't count the stuff I have on planes. <laughs> oh, that doesn't count. No, no, I view that as, as a, like a gift from God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Airplane food is not caloric. That's, that's the uh, big outcome from today. Yeah. As you see the end approaching, though, are, are we, and your, of course, your specialization is marketing and, the, and my, economics. My end approaching. Or no, uh, no, 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 well, or, I, or, or of this event. I can see the end, too. Okay. <laughs> I see the end coming. But are we marketing now geriatric foods? Is it possible to, to sell uh, foods based on their potential for longevity? Well, we're already doing that. If you look at, you go back 10 years, 15 years ago, then whey powder from, you know, the, yeah. which was a, di a, a, a byproduct from the dairy industry, which we used to throw away, then feed to pigs, etc. I mean, it's, it's now a, a the premium part of milk yeah. and is an imbalance globally and now it's not bodybuilders well it is bodybuilders but they're old bodybuilders mm -hmm. it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's people like myself who are worried about uh, losing muscle mass mm -hmm. you know you just see every morning when you look in the you think, not a pretty sight you know, <laughs> you know how on earth can I put a little bit of and, and so yes that, that's that's geriatric food there's one other thing we're faced with here. We, we, we have this thing every five to seven years called Dietary Guidelines for America. Yes. Um, is, is the world following those trends? And what do you think of our current recommendations about fat and carbohydrate composition of our diet? Is, is that a global trend, or are we just being ugly Americans by saying we should have a, a my plate or a food triangle that you know, optimizes health? Actually, many countries, are, as you will know, a, 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 a attempt to, at the government level, attempt to influence uh, diet. Maybe they do at the margin, mm -hmm. but in many cases, you've got so far to go. Uh, the Dutch government, for example, has just uh, advised its uh, nationals that they should eat no more than half a, half a kilo of uh, meat per week. That's 26 kilos per year. That's, uh, let's, say, let's say it's 60 pounds mm -hmm. a, a, a year. How much do they eat? 200 pounds. Wow. So they're not saying, just shave, which is what you guys do. They're not saying, could you just shave your meat consumption a, a, a little? I think it's great. Look, look, eating, we should eat across the, uh, the, the, the range. There are no superfoods. All foods are pretty super yeah. if you eat them in the, you know, the right time and, the, and actually in, in the right amounts. I mean, a lot of it's to do, a plate split up is just fine and dandy, but if it's a huge plate, then that's hopeless. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, I mean, you guys are pretty good at huge plates. <laughs> yeah. We are. Yep. You know, in a few minutes, we're going to move to the audience questions, but I have to ask you this one lo last thought, yeah. and that is you raised an issue of local foods. Yeah. And, of course, the definition of local does vary. Yes, it does. But is that... Um, a, tr a good trend for local foods to be uh, emphasized as a part of a, a healthy diet? Mm, well, is it good or bad? It is pervasive. Yes. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, Thailand, China, that there is m great interest in mm -hmm. local foods. Uh, and for a wide range of reasons. Some people see it being fresher, healthier. Others want to support the local community, etc. Et, et, et Look, that's not going to dominate. Uh, but, and I think it's an important trend and it's one that one should encourage. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean you're going to grow bananas in Columbus. No. Well, with global warming, I hope to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I have ocean front and I won't yeah. have to move. <laughs> you know, it, it is, I'm given this script, so I'm going to have to read this. It's the Metropolitan's Club tradition to take audience questions. Um, so, in, Please state, uh, state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. So the microphone, of course, is right here. And while people are waking up to the microphone, let's please thank Dr. Hughes.
Hi, my name is Brian Williams with uh, Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Uh, I, I wanted to follow up on the, on, on the question you just had about about local food because earlier you know you you talked about the uh, export opportunities and a lot a lot of the changes, but 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 there is this this worldwide trend. Uh, uh, do you see it a, a, a lot more in uh, what I want to say? Uh, when you look at it from the economic perspective, which you said is one of, one of the reasons to do it, the, the local economies, uh, uh, that's what we're trying to do a lot here in, in, in central Ohio, look, look at it economically. Do you see that as, as you know, viable, important uh, to the uh, uh, developing the, uh, economies of the developing countries? Of developing countries, not, not, not of uh, regions in the U.S.? Well, uh, 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 both. I mean, I, I, you know, do you see it as, as, as if we focus on local food here for our e economic uh, uh, reasons, uh, you know, as opposed to yeah, exporting yeah, a, a lot of things, working with these, with these countries and these communities to grow more of their own? So, I mean, to some extent, we're talking about the issue here of food security, and uh, we've forgotten in many cases, you know, what f food security is all about. I'm, I'm 69, so I was born in 1948, we stopped food rationing in the UK in 1954. I was six. Uh, I can quite clearly remember, I used to play with the ration coupons uh, with my sister, we'd play shop. Uh, and it was in 1954 that uh, meat and um, chocolate went, went off at ration. Talk to anybody you know, under the age of 50, and they wouldn't have even a notion about the concept of uh, ration. what rationing. How do you mean rationing? And it sort of intrigued me the, the other day in the UK, we, uh, uh, if you take, so we're about 65% self-sufficient in food in, in the UK. We're huge importers for our size. Uh, and so if you take fresh fruit and vegetables during the, the winter months, we don't have a Florida or a California, so we bring it from Spain or, or, or wherever. And they had, had a bad uh, harvest because of poor climate in, in Spain, and you couldn't buy lettuce. And consumers were outraged as if it was somebody's fault. And, and it's sort of no notion that, uh, you know, how reliant we are. So I think it's not a bad thing every now and again for people to be reminded about issues relating to food security. And let's go back to, uh, to, to developing countries, emerging countries. The problem that they have with regard to getting more and more food security is they want that. So they're expanding, for example, the, the, their production of their staple crop, which might be rice. But in doing so, they're moving to more marginal areas, which is more susceptible uh, to yield variation. So on the one hand, it's sort of a good thing to be more food secure, but by increasing their production, we're also making sure that the world is, uh, is a more volatile place. So there's no easy answer to that. So. All right. Thanks again. This has been very enjoyable for me. Don Justice is my name, and I've got, uh, would you please comment on the following statement from the recent release book, Never Out of Season, by Rob Dunn. In 2016, the supply of calories available to human consumption worldwide was less diverse than ever before. Scientists have identified and studied more than 300,000 living plant species, yet 90% of the calories consumed by humans worldwide came from just 15 plant species. In closing, I'd like to say, after watching your video, my uh, choice from of uh, choice of appetizers changed from calamari to stuffed mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, you know, we are more and more ha have become more and more. It's, it's quite right, more and more reliant, and that brings uh, risks. I mean, a good example. Let me go back to the banana. Uh, that worldwide, ninety-eight percent of uh, production uh, of exports of bananas are for one variety. Cavendish. And uh, apart from black cigatoka, which is a dreadful disease on bananas, there's another one just sort of uh, arrived a few years back. And it has the uh, ability and capacity to wipe out uh, bananas. And you know, for years, we haven't been putting the investment into R&D, et cetera, in, in alternatives. So I, I think we're increasingly aware of the risks associated with biodiversity. I mean, to some, some extent, the, this move towards ancient grains is a little bit refreshing. It's, you know, it's marginal, look, it's only tiny. Uh, but then, you know, again, it's a reminder that um, uh, you know, 
It, 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 it's risky. If you're putting, betting on just a few horses, that's risky. Let's not do it. I'm Ken Thompson. I'm a residential architect. And my question is uh, about the world supply of fish. You've fish. Noted, noted fish are, yeah. the appetite for that across the world is growing. Yeah. Um, my wife and I are eating more and more fish. She likes to avoid farm-raised fish, yeah. so she thinks farming ought to be on land and not on the water. Uh, what is your opinion about that and about the supply of fish? Okay. Uh, as I say, fish is, the, my view, is the single most frequently consumed uh, uh, protein, meat protein. Uh, if you look at what's happening globally, you've got uh, wild-caught fish going down, aquaculture, farm fish going up, and they've passed. So now there's more farm fish than there is wild caught fish. That will continue as we denude the, 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 the seas. There are some good initiatives with regard to uh, MSC, Marine Stewardship Council, uh, you know, sort of encouraging sustainability, uh, et, et cetera. But I think um, uh, the, the challenge is for us to get better at farming fish. Uh, it brings, you know, it does bring problems. You're seeing this at the moment, for example, in salmon. Salmon prices are relatively like double what they were two years ago. What's that about? It's about lice on the fish, and what does, how do they get lice on them because of concentrated farming? We've just got to get be better at it. But uh, I mean, luckily, uh, you look to me, n n no offence, of an income where you'll be able to afford the the wild caught. And so, uh, you know, <laughs> so you, your wife won't be disappointed. It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I'm Jenny Hubble with the American Dairy Association, and you talked a little bit about plant-based yeah. foods. So as we look at the dairy case, there's a lot of other beverages uh, filling the shelf, coconut, almond, uh, soy, pea, yeah. you mentioned pea a little bit ago, yeah. um, milks, if you will. Yeah. So how do you see that affecting uh, fluid milk, um, or how is it affecting right. around the country? I mean, I mean, really good question, and, and I know you'll know part of the answer, but if, if take my market, the UK, the only area of growth in the dairy department in supermarkets is in non-dairy dairy. <laughs> uh, now, does that mean it's the end? No, because as you will know that uh, actually in the longer term, global demand for dairy-based products is growing at, let's say, 3%. Global supply is underperforming in that regard. It wouldn't seem like that over the last couple of years because it's been pretty, pretty dire. So I think the challenge is that, uh, you know, to, from a, a, a dairy industry, it, it's, it's about the export market, if, if you will, to drive overall uh, demand. But um, no, it's, it's, I know it's been tough out there. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I, have to, I have to ask you a very personal question that you right. might not have to answer. Right, right. Do you spiralize? That's my <laughs> uh, uh, Only uh, with consenting adults. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. What an insightful forum. Thank you so much, Dr. Hughes. I'm still trying to get the mental image of the beef, beef producer out of my mind, so I'm <laughs> working on that. You can view today, view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio channel and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. We recognize that there are many trade associations in the room, so we definitely invite you to please link today's video to your websites and share it among your members. Please help me thank our partners and sponsors, the Ohio Agricultural Council, Ohio Agribusiness Association, and the Ohio Farm Bureau Federation. Thank you so much for your support. We would also like to thank our wonderful speaker, Dr. Food, as well as Dr. Ken Lee from The Ohio State University. And a special thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you again at CMC soon. Have a great afternoon.